Okay. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's presentation. Okay, just in the start. Welcome to today's presentation. My name is Wycliffe Agumba. Although I'm a doctoral student at the University of Bonn here in Germany. Uh, I'll be happy to take us through, even though we are only four people today, I'll be happy to take us through the uh, third chapter. There's been some miscommunication about the chapter we are handling today. It's uh, going to be the third chapter of the book, Mastering Shining with R. So welcome, I'll share my screen. Um, I didn't make any significant changes on the, or even at all, changes on the previous uh, group's uh, presentation. So that is what I'm going to go through with a, a few demos here and there. And then we'll be learning from there. This is going to be my first presentation on uh, book club. So if I go astray, please bring me back to the line. And uh, we are free to interject at any given point so that we um, we are all comfortable. Yeah. I mean, if I miss something, you just jump in and clarify. Or if you need more clarification, please. So um, chapter three is talking about basic reactivity. Already um, we covered uh, the user interface um, last week by Olua Femi, and today we are going to look at the server side of it. We understand that Shiny App is all about the user interface and the back end, which is the server uh, side of it. So. The interactivity is now the communication between the front end and the back end uh, of the app. So the learning objectives will be to explain more detail about the input and output. So how um, just a minute. Turn off this. Yeah. How how we how the input that we give to the app. Uh, is received by the server and then how the server processes this and spits out uh, an output. Then we will also differentiate between imperative and declarative programming, which are a bit new terms to me, and then uh, describe the basics of reactivity, um, the connection between the input and output and how these uh, continuously yield outputs. Then lastly, um, how reactive expressions help us to eliminate duplications. So we have a short recap on this, whereby we talk about uh, R script versus, uh, which, which, which normally comes as a sequential flow of logic. Like you bring in data, you wrangle the data, you print some output or uh, plot some output of it out of it. But when we talk about reactive programming, then there is something comes in called dependencies or graph dependencies in which several uh, inputs come in together and received by some uh, interface, which then carries this to the output. So there is that dependency on several um, inlet to the same uh, argument, which will then be pushed to the output. So this is going to be a new kind of new paradigm in understanding how R works, not the normal way of read CSV, select all these, filter where this, then summarize by this and plot. Here is going to be you feed in the data and the, you feed in the input and these input are taken differently. And then the server receives it, wrangles it and pushes out some output. Then, so in this, we are going to learn new things on front end, which is the user interface object. Um, what the user sees, like now the web page we are looking at or uh, the interface with our mobile phones or ATM machines when we are withdrawing money, what you see like select language do this, those are the input. And then the back end, 
which is what happens at the back, uh, what happens in the server itself, uh, that, that is termed as the back end of the Shiny app. And uh, normally front end is similar to everybody. Uh, that is, it's a bit simple because every user gets the same HTML uh, inter uh, in the front end, what we see. Um, of course, there are some differences, some slight situations when the front end can depend on uh, a user. Like we can have the same front end, but once you put your password, then what you are, can access is different from what another person can access. But that's another level. Uh, generally, the front end is simple and the same to everyone, but the back end depends on what the front end queried. So it's a bit complex when it comes to the back end. Um, yeah, and I mean, this is now coming to realization. I'm coming to realization that if you are an R developer or a shiny app developer, you we need to have both front end and back end tests. Uh, as opposed to Java, JavaScript, or whichever other programming language where people specialize in the back end, some people specialize in the front end. I think Shiny here, we just have to bring the two together because for the app to run, we need both uh, input and output. But then another important thing is this graphic here, where um, while the user interface is the same to everybody, when they query the database or the server, then each person receives a unique uh, output or a unique session is created for each person. Um, so that when somebody manipulates the front end in some way, this does not um, uh, affect all other users. If somebody changes a slider or changes an input from zero to one, it should only be corresponding to their interface. They should only be seeing the output themselves, not everybody else who is also using the same um, Shiny app elsewhere. Um, uh, Somebody is asking whether the server is responsible for handling. Um, yes. Um, yeah, you, you can think of it as a ATM machine. When when you put in your card to withdraw money from ATM machine in your nearest ATM machine, there are thousands of other people withdrawing money. But it's it the server, the back end, which is processing all this money and bringing you back, the pushing notes to you, will only be pushing notes to you depending on what you feed to it. But the user interface is the same. Yeah, so it handles multiple kind of sessions. Then a uh, slightly deeper dive into this. So in the, in the back end or in the server end of the Shiny app, we have the server object, which is created as a function, which takes input, output, and session arguments. And uh, both input and output, these are the ones we are going to concentrate on today and session probably in the future. So the input is a list-like object. You can think of it as a list-like object. Um, and the output is also a list-like object. So that's a similarity between this input and output uh, arguments in the server function. So the input is what receives a message from the browser or from the user interface. And then it's a read-only uh, kind of object or kind of uh, uh, argument, you cannot manipulate it within the server. You cannot assign a new value, for example, to an input. Um, in the book, it says, uh, server takes uh, the input as the single source of truth. So you cannot manipulate it in between uh, the user interface and the server. You cannot break it. And you can imagine if it could be broken, then uh, it, it will be messy working with shiny apps or creating apps because somebody would be intervening um, 
the, the, the server could not understand whether what we are feeding in is what it should be processing or something which has been breached in between. And then the output is also a list, like I've said that, and then it is used to push out uh, uh, what the what is rendered to the to the user, what comes out of the running of the app or yeah, of the running of the application. Like um, the user interface can say, select language English, select amount 2000, and then you are withdrawing <clears throat> money from an ATM. So the output will be the what is thrown to you, like the money which you receive back from the machine. Um, so how these interact is, for example, the user interface, we've talked about this, where we have several kinds of input which can go here, text input, date input, numeric input, several input. And then they have the input ID, like a name and a label. So this label is what um, the user sees. Uh, um, is what directs, kind of guides the user on what to put in the name slot. And then text output is what uh, the server will receive mm -hmm. from the user interface uh, object or kind of list. Um, so when we are thinking of this as a list object, is whereby, for example, we had another input like numeric input, date input, several inputs going in. Like you select your age, you select your gender, you select something, and then you push it. So all these objects are coming in as a as a list to the use UI, and then they receive it. What is received by the server? Of course, it's a function of input, output, and session. But then the output, it's sorry, the uh, okay, the output it's uh, yielding will be caught from the ID of the text output. This is a text output uh, or output ID greeting. So it's picking that greeting and rendering it. The function that is used in the server side is to is render. Um, it's a render then a function follows it, render function. So it, it can render text, it can render date, it can render uh, text verbatim and so many other render options. And then, it, uh, of course, paste is a regular function we use, then hello, and then some space, and then input name. Um, so this is a basic reaction or interactivity which occurs between the user interface and the server end. Um, a simple demo on this, um, uh, dive into the server, we can have user interface with, this is just a skeleton of it where we have nothing at all at all in the user interface, just the function fluid page. And then the server also, we have nothing at all at all, um, just the function itself, an empty function. All this will run, but of course, it's basically throwing anything at all. Okay. Open that in browser, nothing happens. It's just an empty a, a web page. Um, but then if we add some uh, inter some something in the user interface, which a user can put like numeric input, like some numbers, and we give it a unique ID of count, um, and we level it as maybe enter a number or enter your age or enter your height or something like that. And then the default value is 100. Um, and we leave the server side still empty. We can run this up and then, sorry, that was still listening. So I need to stop it by escape. And then we can run this. Um, control Alt Shift H. Um, then we open that in a browser. So we have an a user interface. This is what user sees. Like you tell the user to enter some number, can be 55, can be 55,885, whichever number the user enters. And this number should therefore be received by the server. But currently, our server is uh, empty. The back end logic, nothing is happening. Um, so to add something in the server, something to play with the number we are entering, we have the input ID, the label, the value. And then we tell server to catch an output. The output it's going to catch is coming from an output ID number. 
So server and then the output uh, captures this and we render text because um, we are spitting out some text value like uh, the input value is and then it puts the count which was entered in the UI. So again, if we re-render this, again, we need to skip that. Hmm. Okay. And then open in a browser. Uh, so we are now seeing something happening. If we change this number, if we increase it to 101, the input value was or something like that, was 101. So what the user fed in, it makes some cycle, it takes some cycle. We give it the, the digit, then it takes the digit to the server function and the server speaks it back to us. I mean, the simplest kind of interactivity we can think of at this level. Okay. Um, then before we get to reactive programming, maybe we look at it from this end. Unless if there is any question on this, how um, we pass in some information in the server, in the user interface, and then the output receives it. No, so I think from my own side, there is no question. Just I just want to chip in one or two things uh, because from my own experience, uh, looking at uh, the UI, I think we have text outputs, the output ID, greetings. Then looking mm -hmm. at the server, we need to make sure that we call use the same name, name tag in the outputs because at yeah. times if we do not reference the name in the right format, Though the app is going to run, but we are not going to get any results in that you will, yes. because you. I thank just you. want to chip. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Olua Femi, for that. I mean, uh, yeah, if there is a, a difference, any slight difference, we are going to see that, I think, in another session, uh, presentation, or yeah. If there is any difference between the ID you have, we have in the user interface uh, input sorry, what we are going to output, if it is different from what we are telling the server to output, the app will run, but it will not give us um, what we anticipated. For example, if instead of uh, output number, we just say number with, a, with R, without E, but uh, what we have as the ID was number, then this app will run. Yeah, if we run it, it runs. It's not throwing any error. But we wanted to see the number, something like uh, the number entered is, but it, the, the number entered is is now not showing. So this is, uh, uh, Shiny is a bit quiet on throwing errors, but it's, it's, a, it's kind of ignoring you silently that, okay, you are telling me to push out something which you have not given me in the user interface. So we must, uh, that one is something that we need to be very, very careful of. Yeah, thank you for chipping in on that. Then uh, there is reactive programming. Um, well, so um, reactive programming, there is this quote from the author, Hadley, that Reactive programming is an elegant and powerful programming paradigm, but it can be disorienting at first because it's a very different paradigm to writing a script. Um, our normal way of writing our script, as I said earlier, is read, uh, manipulate, plot, or visualize, or do something which is kind of one of, or if you have a loop, a for loop, or par loop, map, double map character, I mean, it's a bit straightforward. But when we are talking about uh, 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 reactivity or reactive programming using Shiny, then we are facing um, another challenge. Like we have just seen, we are throwing some error. We are, we are putting, we are manipulating the names of the IDs, but Shiny is just running. It's not throwing an error to us. Silently, uh, the, the app is actually not working the way we want it. So, um, in 
in in in shiny we are not giving it commands but we are providing it with all it needs we should be providing it with all it needs to produce the output we want so it's more of recipes but not commands like you can say sum of 10 numbers that is giving commands but recipe I, I i have kind of these numbers i have those numbers i have these numbers when i want some of these numbers give me something like that so it's a different paradigm so that brings us to imperative and uh, versus declarative programming whereby in, in imperative programming we di directly declare um, commands like we give specific commands in the code but in declarative we provide uh, options like these are the things we have these are the recipe make for us this bake for us this so it's upon the app to to to, to pick what is necessary to produce what the end result we need and uh, they emphasize this by saying imperative code is a bit assertive while declarative is passive aggressive um it's the best the way i think of it is like uh, you give a function uh, arguments and it executes it that's imp imperative but declarative you give options so many options for what it needs to build something but then out of this you can ask questions you can manipulate the questions you ask and you get different outputs varied outputs so it also says that something like make me a sandwich then ensure that there is a sandwich in refrigerator whenever i look inside of it so these are two slight different paradigms of doing the same thing um yeah it's it's a bit disorienting <laughs> as hardly puts it somewhere here but i mean yeah it's it's again the beauty of shiny because we are now shifting our mindset from the it's it's something new we are learning from uh, the normal or the regular r way of doing things um and yeah that's just that so laziness um so the shiny way of doing things like uh, the reactive uh, way of doing things in shiny makes it a bit lazy um laziness as is, uh, in the sense that not that shiny does not want to do what we want it to do but it's only that it has so many options and it only executes the bare minimum necessary to give us the output we want all other things that are built within the shiny that we don't need will all be silent and it will only run what it takes to give us the output we want so um shiny's aim is to only do the work that is needed um if if we think of an example like somebody asks you what is your name and you say wickliffe that is that is what the person wanted but if you start saying my name is Wycliffe, I'm 10 years old, I like running, you are never asked those ones. So there are, some, there are options you have in your brain or in your mind, but nobody asks you about those. So that is the kind of laziness which is an upside of, uh, of shining. So um, we get to an app which we, we are asked whether it will work or not. I'm trying to fit this within the same window so that you see both the, we all see the library, the user interface side and also the server side plus the running of the app. So if we can take a few seconds to look at it and say whether it will run or not. Um, for example, if I can just say that it's a fluid page, text input is name, uh, that is the input ID and the label it, what is your name, question mark and quotation closed. Then text output is greeting, and there is another text output, nice day. And there is a comma, comma. On the server end is input output session, as we expect. And then output greeting, we render string C or struct str underscore C. Hello, then some input goes there. Yeah. And then output next day. And then we have some output. We can tell whether this will run or not. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, I say that there is a problem with the output with the sub side. Huh? If you look at the output, mm -hmm. sign nice is N I C instead of I N C E. Okay. So that's okay. one observation I'm making. I'm not sure now whether it will run or not. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. even what you have said about laziness, maybe it will run. I'm not very sure about that. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, you pointed out that there is some error in the object name, uh, in the name from the UI object. Uh, what we are catching in the server is not what we declared in the output of the user interface. So, and then you're saying you're not sure whether it's going to run or not. Of course, it's going to run. The app will run. Um, I have the app. Um, yeah, here it is. We have Nick Day and we have uh, Nice Day. So if we run it the way it is, um, it will run. We have the output. Oh, of course, we have this error first of all. Would not find the function strc. Uh, that is because strc is uh, from stringer and we've not provided this, we've not loaded the library stringer up there. Not sure whether that was part of the trick in the question. Um, let me see. They only loaded shiny and up there we've never loaded a stringer package. So when they are calling this strc strc without uh, specifying explicitly that it's coming from a stringer package then that's that's that throws an error mm -hmm. so we've provided what it was asking for uh stop the former um Open it in browser for everyone to see. And what is your name? Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 spitting the output we, we want. It's running. But uh, the part which is not running is this one here. R is lazy. It knows there is a problem, but uh, not R, but R sh the shiny app is lazy. It knows that there is a problem here. It doesn't run it. It only runs where it's a greeting, hello, and then the input name, exclamation. Where there is a, something, it doesn't know where it's coming from, it leaves it uh, for you to think of it. So as Oluwafemi pointed out clearly, we must make sure that um, what we give in the input, text output, or the user interface, we link the same same name in the uh, server end. So if we do that, first of all, let me stop this. Yeah. Yeah, so we have both of them output, like hello, somebody, and then have a nice day, somebody. So we can put your name, and then immediately we start typing the name. The server is taking whatever we put there. It doesn't know whether my name is W and Y alone. So if I add C, C comes in. When I add L, it comes in and all that. Yeah. Uh, something I also noted is that uh, if you type your name like Wycliffe and then you add another name like that, it's fine. But if you add two sp one space, it will put the space between uh, the exclamation mark and the last name. There is some space in between here. But if you put more spaces, like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spaces, no more spacing. So if I add my third name way far ahead, it's still one space. Hmm. So there is no weekly several weekly Fagumba several spaces on watch. That's not my name. So yeah, interesting. And then um, after that basic reactivity, uh, if you're working on a shiny app, you just can't figure out why your code never gets run. Double check that your UI and server functions are using the same identifiers. Text ID, uh, output ID, um, and then output ID must be the same. So the caution is like a trick. Um, the reactive graph. 
Um, so this is helpful in understanding the order of execution when it receives some input and how this input that the user gives uh, in the user interface is received by the server. Um, and it also bring in the aspect of code is only run when necessary. And this also emphasizes on the laziness. Like you can be having um, an interface where you input 30 or maybe five different input parameters. So if you only change one of them, then all others are already kind of known by the server. It's only the, the one which you change, which will feed into the reactive uh, function. And then all others are held constant and output is given. Um, it also describes how inputs and outputs are connected, of course, and uh, also shows some de dependencies like this output has got a reactive dependency on input or greeting as a reactive dependency on name. That is, if name changes, whoever is being greeted also changes the output it will throw. Um, reactive graph is important or is powerful for understanding how your uh, apps work. And we can make it by hand by just drawing. I was thinking of this like um, a conceptual framework in thesis writing or in paper writing, uh, where you show the interactions between your independent and dependent and intervening confounding variables and uh, trying to see which variables feed into which or, or graphical abstract for those who have seen such. But then we can also use packages like diagramma R package. Uh, and there is also this React catalog, which we will see later. Um, so that's about reactive expression. Um, yeah, that's going to be in the third 3.6. So um, in reactive expressions, we are talking about reducing duplications in our application so that if we were to put more codes or uh, call several uh, functions um, on the same kind of inputs, we can just use one to wrap all that in a reactive sense or a reactive function. And then we use the function, which is now less uh, cumbersome or easier to read. Uh, and in this example, reactive is a function in the Shiny app or Shiny library. So, it wraps the input, whatever is changing, whatever is changing, it feeds to another object, which is called string in this case. And then this string is now a function, is now treated as a, a reactive function. So we assign it the two bracket, opening and closing brackets, which we normally use with the functions in R. So in this render text, we don't again say paste hello input and all those exclamation marks because they are already fed into the reactive. Uh, function string. Um, so they are cleaner. That's what the, they insisted on, that this is now more cleaner or more concise. Uh, and it removes, it removes redundancy in the codes. Well, uh, to give an example of this, where we have uh, yeah, it's the same thing we have over there. So if we run this, we'll have uh, the name changing and then the reactive. Uh, first of all, we stop that. Yeah, yes, the same thing I said. Uh, if we change weekly, if we, we put in the names here, the reactive expression is picking this and uh, the string is, being read, rendered from the reactive expression itself, the reactive function itself. Um, there are a couple of exercises. Uh, I think we still have some minutes. We can check on this. Of course, we are not yet to the end, but there are some in interesting exercises which uh, we can look at. Now, um, given this user interface, and the user interface is a fluid page where we have a, an input ID of name and then label of what's your name. And then the text output to be caught by the server is uh, ID greeting. So correct each of the following servers. So we have server one, server two, server three, and then 
we we run the app. So uh, server one has a problem. Can somebody point out the problem? Yeah, there's the name server there in inside uh, the function. This one? Yeah, I don't know whether that's a problem. Instead <laughs> of session. Ah, oh, yeah, it's a universal issue all around. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, let, okay. maybe the best thing is to run it without ad, ad, addressing anything. And then mm. we, see, we see what happens. Okay. Let me stop that, then run this. Oh, <laughs> uh, greeting structure function. What is being called here? We are calling server one. Okay, modify read only. Ah, okay, some information, some important information being leaked to us. So maybe before running them, I think we need to, it's, it's interesting that somebody pointed out this already, calling it server instead of session. Uh, anything else? Also, I think line 144, they're having inputs dollar sign greeting instead of outputs dollar sign greeting. Exactly. Yeah. What server does it outputs? Whatever it renders, it outputs it and it receives it from greeting. Mm -hmm. Will our server one now work? Mm -hmm. Is it server one will not work because we still need to call the input dollar sign name. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, oh. we need to catch this ID. We need to catch this ID from the user interface and we can't just call the name as if it was a variable we created in our other world of thinking in R. This is a different world of thinking in R. So we need to receive the input uh, dollar sign name. Up to that, I am convinced that if we call this, it will work. Of course, we also have this server two and server three, but they are not, uh, our lazy uh, app will not run them. It will only be concerned with what we need to output. Okay. Now open in browser. Yeah, so what is your name? It's working. Yeah, but that is server one. Server one solved, server two. So I've just changed the server we are running to server two. So the lazy companion will not work with server one now. It will go to server two and check it. So server two, we have input, output and server again. And then uh, greeting, paste hello and input name, and then output greeting, render greeting. Hmm. No reactive expression. Uh, no reactive expression. Uh, so we need to create reactive here so that greeting becomes reactive and we treat it as reactive, right? Yes. Yeah. Because initially, which what is it was it was doing it was manipulating, um, it was manipulating the input by creating a new object inside the server, and this is what we said cannot happen. Generally, cannot happen. Like the only source of truth is the input, the user interface. So it cannot create another object and then render that object being created within the server. Um, here we create a reactive uh, function and then we call the reactive function inside the, as the output of the greeting, which is the text input here. So we can escape to the former and then give this shot. Yeah. So that works. Yeah. And then um, server three. Server three has a function input output and server. Of course, now we did not interfere with the server. So server and session, hmm, 
Uh, the lazy companion ignored them. Anyway, we are not using server or session yet. We are still running with the input and output. So probably Shiny is comfortable with that. And then server three is taking a function. It's a function input, output, and server, then output greeting, which is uh, paste, hello, and input name. Why would this not work? Uh, oh, it's unfortunate that um, um, uh, Vega cannot uh, speak. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Can somebody point to this? Yeah, we are there's missing no render. There's no render. Yeah, we are missing render text. Yeah. So we need to render and render text that, and then we need to close it. Yeah, like that. So this should work. Uh, I'll change this to server three, and then we go to the UI, all other servers, uh, Shiny will not, uh, sorry, will not bother about them. Um, yeah, this is working. Okay. Um, drawing, uh, so there are some exercise about uh, drawing. I did some simple ones. Like we have a server. Uh, if I can just check on the chart, the input ID. Ah, okay, okay. Jim, I think it's quite similar, but it triggers automatically. Mm -hmm. React log. Okay, seems no question. So uh, in drawing these reactive um, graphics, for example, when we have a server in which we have a C, a function where we have C being reactive or having a reactive dependency on input A and B, and then E receives from the, the reactive expression C and also an input D, and then output F renders uh, the, the output of the reactive expression E. So I tried this where we have C being receiving input from A and B. And then this C feeds into E and the E is receiving reactive expression of C as well as new input D. And then this feeds out to, uh, renders out to F. So the reactive expression E is rendered out in F. Um, the second one was about a server which takes, which has X and Y being reactive on input, X being reactive on X1, X2, X3, the sum of those, and then Y being reactive on Y1 and Y2. Then Z renders the two, X and Y. So I thought of X and then it's now receiving from three. So it has got three ports where uh, inputs can fit, both X1, X2, all X1, X2, and X3 and then they fit into X. Once we have X, there is also Y. Onto this Y, we add Y1 and Y2, and then both of them fit into Z. So Z will only change when any of these changes, because X is a product of this. So if one of these changes, then that is when Z will change, or if either of these changes, yeah. The last one, which was a bit tricky, started with the D uh, being reactive on C and input D, uh, A being reactive on input A, and then that same same A multiplied by 10, the input. And then reactive B, uh, reactive C being reactive, uh, receiving reactive B and C, 
which is an input, independent input kind of. And then B being on reactive A plus input B. These are not very strange things. It's all about the user interface having some open slots to key in some items. Like you key in A, you key in B, you key in C, you key in D. But there is reactivity in the back end in which what you do with the slot for A and B with, for example, slot A affects B. So whatever will be rendered in the output or in the final output has got dependency on several other inputs within the framework. So I thought of B being dependent on A and B, but A has to be multiplied at some interface by a value of 10. And then this feeds into C, which receives another slot of C as an input. And then this feeds into D, which also has an open slot for input D itself. Yeah. It was a bit complex. I tried to wrap it around my brain and yeah, that's the graphic I came up with. I hope this is correct. Okay. So other than the exercises, we... Okay. Yeah. We have... Uh, there that 0.6. After the slides, we have the motivation. Reactive expression. Yeah, that's still on reactive expression. So um, it talked about a simulation, kind of, where we build a function. And uh, we want to test, for example, um, uh, how changes in one thing affects the output. So the best way or one could think of this is to make simulation, create a function, the normal way we create a function in R. And of course, we start by loading a ggplot library because we will need it down here. So we can, the function can take two objects, x1 and x2 and then another variable which is already specified, argument which is already having a parameter 0 0.1 as a bin width, and then the limits. So the function builds or creates a data frame with uh, variables x and g, where x takes the numeric inputs x1 and x2, and g repeats uh, x1 to the length of x1 here, and also repeats x2 to the length of x2. So you can imagine over two column data frame with first one, x, x, one, x, one, x, one, x, one, and then x, two, x, two, x, two, x, two. So as the G. Then ggplot builds a, a, a frequency polygon using this. And then the bin width takes the bin width, which means the first two arguments are taken as they are, and then code Cartesian with the limits set to x length. Another thing which happens in this function it's another function, which is a t-test function, um, which takes the two variables or the two vectors, x1 and x2, and runs a t-test. Then an output is printed with the, with the confidence intervals extracted for both x1 and x2. Now, yeah, this uh, normal uh, function, a simple function, but now when we get the data, which is a random, a randomly generated, maybe just take this back to 200, a randomly generated 200 values, numbers with a mean of zero and standard deviation of 0 0.5, and then build a frequency polygon using this freq poly, which has been created here. Interesting how this freq poly function binds with the geom, which we have from geom, uh, geom ggplot2 to create the, the output. So, x1 and x2 are those random numbers, vectors, they are vectors, and then frequency polygon will build the polygon and this will test the, uh, will test the, will do the t-test or compare the two uh, uh, vectors. So we have the output, but you can imagine if we want to tweak this, if we want to change something um, within this, or even the 200 or this, we need to run all this and then back to this. But this can be simplified in um, a shiny app 
where we give a user interface, uh, the arguments like, uh, and maybe here we need to make it clear that there is this column function again, so that our user interface is divided into several sections. We'll see when we run this up. And the width being set to four, 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 here, four, here, four, here, four, means, okay, a single uh, face interface or a single user interface is divided into 12 sections, can be divided into 12 sections, so, or 12 columns. So we can set the width to be four, 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 and four times three is 12. So we shall have maximized the use of that user interface. And then the rest are just numeric input with the IDs, the labels, the value, the minimum or the step, which is used to shift from one to the next. Then the server end uh, function input output, we create a histogram, which is a render plot. And uh, yeah, we render plot on that. And then we bring in the frequency polygon. We also render the t-test which takes the two RNOM input output. So you can see them here. Then we run the shiny. So if we run this as an app, it becomes easier to tweak it uh, as in to manipulate the values and the numbers and see the output better than if we use, uh... okay, maybe I'll open it in the browser and then reduce the zoom in a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is what we meant by dividing them into four, four, four. The total is 12, so we have some distribution one, distribution two, and frequency polygon as the labels for these columns. Then below it, we have the output, the plot output. So whenever we change any of these, we can easily interact with this uh, uh, plot uh, more user-friendly than if we have to rerun the code again and again and again in the user interface, in, in the normal R setting. Uh, producers and consumers, that's another aspect which is uh, mentioned in the, in the documentation, but I would stick with the input expression and output other than producers and consumers. It was too more agricultural than what I find easy to learn. But anyway, somebody can find producers being easier to capture and consumers than input and output. Okay. Time is quite moving fast. Execution order, this is another thing which does not matter. Um, uh, execution order does not matter much. For example, here we are creating a string which is reactive and we have paste this, 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 the same way we build reactive earlier up somewhere there. And then we are calling it in the upper line, line 238 instead of line 240. So what happens with this, our shiny friend uh, or lazy friend called shiny is that it's, it just keep quiet in line 238. It ignores it because it knows nothing about this string. But when it gets to line 239, it sees that string is a reactive expression. So it brings, it recalls, okay, if it's a re reactive expression, then I can output this greeting you want, yeah. So it doesn't matter that we create this app before we uh, we call it or we run it, we, we we write it as a as a function. This is very strange from the normal R expression. You need to create an object first. Uh, for example, if you create an object A is equal to one, uh, is a function of maybe one to ten, you need to do that before you say A plus one, A plus something. You need to create it first. You cannot start with B uh, or B plus two if we don't have that B. Oh, seems we had B somewhere in my, uh, yeah. So B plus two or plus five is an error, B not found in the normal R environment. But in a reactive sense of shiny up, we can call B, we can write this up or low or below. But I would advise or I would recommend that we start with the, the creating it and then calling it later, which is way, way easier. Um, less minutes, but a very, very important thing left on uh, um, controlling timing of evaluation. Uh, like sometimes we want a, a, 
we want to manipulate some evaluation or run some app based on time so that we simulate it even more. Uh, we leave the app to run the way it, for example, it receives some inputs and within certain period of time, it runs an output, it chunks, it throws out, it spits out some output from the function. So that can be achieved using a reactive timer and we set time to it and we create, of course, that's another reactive function called reactive timer. And therefore, whatever it creates here, we can assign it two brackets. It's, it becomes kind of a function. Um, and then once it's a function, it then receives the input uh, from this, like R norm or R poison distribution or whichever R we use, or run it, and then builds the output histogram. Mm -hmm. So reactive timer works with time kind of when the time changes and this time is in milliseconds yeah so 500 milliseconds is like half a second uh if you open this again in browser you can see the graph changing within half a second it doesn't uh it runs within every half a second uh arpo is, is generating uh numbers and those numbers are being plotted automatically yeah interactively and then this can also be done on click other than setting a timer to run this we can say okay i want to click something for it to execute the function so we have event reactive function uh we also talked about uh, the reactive timer so event reactive is when event occurs or when a click occurs, when something occurs, then it executes. Uh, the same, same functions. And then we have this output, you can open it in browser. So nothing appears on the plot, but if I click on this simulate, which is an action button, uh, then a plotting occurs. If I click simulate again, it generates another plot. If I click simulate again, it changes. So it doesn't change on time, but it changes on action or an event. That's uh, event reactive, quite important if you're simulating. Um, we also have observers. Um, our time is up, but just a few more seconds. Um, with observers, we are uh, kind of uh, giving out some information in the console or uh, updating a database um yeah I think that's what we have here that you can be running something which you don't really need to uh to show something that you really don't need to show in the user interface like updating a database or printing a debugging message like there is an error somewhere you you just put it in the console not in the user interface it's not something you render outside but you can put it in the console. You can print it in the console. So those are uh, considered as observers or they are under observers. So to render them, um, we use observe event and then the message that we want to be observed. For example, if the name changes here, um, if the name in the input changes, then uh, the observe event greeting performed will be printed in the console. Greeting performed, greeting performed. Yeah. Yeah, like this. So if I say uh, weekly and I stop, greeting performed. If I add a Goomba, then greeting performed, greeting performed. So it can be a way of collecting some logging or if somebody's using the app somewhere and you want to know how many people are using the code somebody used somebody signed somebody did this or something like that you can be collecting this code uh, in the this output in the this log in the uh, in the console yeah so that one you don't need to print it in the user interface that greeting performed the user doesn't need to see that but you at the back end you might be interested in getting some information about how the app is being used some statistics or some information or yeah for debugging also well, so in a nutshell, we, I think we have captured what it takes when we are talking about reactive programming, uh, reactive, uh, basic reactivity in Shiny app. 
where the user interface um, meets the server to generate output. And this can be rendered periodically when we talk of uh, timers uh, or interactively where we talk of simulate or event reactive, when you click, when you press, when you do this. And uh, we can also have observers to take uh, note of what's happening at the back of this. Uh, acknowledgements in the book are made to the diagramma package. I didn't use it in the slides. I just, uh, in the slides I showed, I just used uh, uh, basic uh, normal PowerPoint to build those uh, flows. But diagramma, I've tried it a bit. Uh, it's also interesting to show some reactions. For example, if we run this control Z, if we run this, we'll see uh, something rendered in the output uh, in, in the viewer. So another interesting package one can think of also this kind of the same output, uh, same workflow, like the arrow from this to this, from this feeds to this. Uh, yeah, probably we'll use it more in the future. Well, what really motivated me towards this, I think that comes to the end, but what motivated me is this application which was built by some researchers in Crete, near Greece. Uh, they built a shiny app. As I said, I, I study wild edible plants and their distribution and all that. So they built a shiny app where you can see potential suitable habitats uh, of these specific wild edible plants and to what degree uh, those sites are potentially suitable. So the reactivity here, the user changes the input and the, the pointer here moves across the space and points there. When it points there, the values of the suitability score varies. This is something I want to build and make it even more sophisticated by adding things like time period, like present, future scenarios, future projected climate scenarios, what will be the suitability like and also plotting some output on this file right end on my uh, on, on part of my work. So working on this reactivity is very, very interesting to me and also is likely to give me more impetus in generating these kinds of things reactive, reactively. I mean, which makes the output of your work quite simple to understand to the general public. This is also reactive on this. You can move the slider and all of that. I mean, this is... Uh, available to the public domain. I think I can just also share it uh, in the chat if you want to have a look at it. And yeah. Okay, unless if there is any question, we are five minutes past time. <laughs> 